dirty, depressed bride. He is coming back for a spotless, glorious bride. And I want to say, I love you. You, Bethesda, are representation of the spotless, glorious bride. And I love that I get to come here together with you on a Sunday and just immerse ourselves in his presence and just love on him and minister to him. Isn't it a, isn't it a privilege just to minister to Jesus, come together, minister to each other? I just feel so honored. I feel so honored to bring the word today. So, Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you that it's saturated with your presence. I thank you that every heart will receive, every ear will hear what you're saying. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So we're going to start Hebrews 10.25. If you have your Bible, open up to Hebrews 10.25. And I'm going to read out of the Passion Translation. The Bible is so powerful. The Word is so powerful that even when I declare out a verse, there's things happening in the spirit realm. You know, when we were singing that song, Hallelujah, this morning, I was reminded of a story that I remember Reinhard Bonnke sharing. And he was in Africa doing one of his crusades. And the witches had come out, the local witches had come out to curse him. And they were, I mean, all sorts of curses against him and his ministry and this crusade. And, and they were at all four corners of this crusade. And Reinhardt heard about it. And he told his team, it doesn't matter. Because he that's in us is greater than he that's in the world. And so he got up there and all he said I don't know if you've heard Reinhard Bonnke, and you know his booming voice. He's in the glory now. But he said in this booming voice on the microphone, Hallelujah! And he said it, I think, multiple times. And the testimony that came back was as soon as that word came out of his mouth and the Hallelujah came out of everyone's mouth in that stadium, in that place, that those four witches started choking fell on the ground under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And as we were singing that hallelujah song this morning, I saw all witchcraft in this region having to bow, having the life cut off. Because, you know, that is, that is, who is the head? We are the body. And I just saw the city of Vancouver, it was like as we were releasing that hallelujah, there was witchcraft that was coming unto and submitting, surrendering and submitting to the Lord. And it was like the four corners of, of Vancouver, and it spread out into the Portland area. And I'm telling you this, I'm telling you this, if Gideon's army of 300 people took a clay pot <laughs> and some fire and defeated an army, that was way bigger than them, just in that surrendered praise, that surrendered obedience. I'm telling you, there's nothing we can't see right here and right now in this region. There is nothing we can't see. Our worship is doing things in the spirit. And so I just want to encourage you, we're not backing down. We're not going to quiet our voices. We're not going to shorten our worship sets. We're not going to stop speaking in tongues. We got a one-star review here last week on Google because we speak in tongues. Let me tell you something, and I'm not mocking that person, but I am mocking that spirit. And I'll tell you something, that even if the, you know, she quoted a scripture verse about interpretation of tongues, and that's in the word. But I'm telling you, if you listen carefully to someone who is speaking in tongues and you listen to a following statement that comes out, that is the translation of those tongues. So if you're not aware of what's happening in the spirit and you hear the tongues and you're not listening for, some, for a verbal sentence to come out of someone else's mouth, that's usually the translation of the tongues that were released. Just to be aware of that. 
So here we go. I got off on a little rabbit trail there. That hallelujah song was, woo. Hebrews 10, 25. This is not the time to pull away and neglect meeting together, as some have formed the habit of doing. In fact, we should come together even more frequently, eager to encourage and urge each other onward as we anticipate that, that day dawning. Romans 1, 12. We'll go to that one. Now this means that when we come together and are side by side, something wonderful will be released. We can expect to be co-encouraged, co-comforted by each other's faith. We're not just coming to church here to sing songs and kumbaya and go home feeling a little better. We're coming together to and forming a habit of doing that because we're, when we come, we actually encourage someone else. If I think that I'm not worthy or I think that I don't matter and I don't see myself as a new creature and I don't see that I'm an agent of change, an ambassador of heaven, I probably won't feel like I need to go to church. But if I know who I am and I know that someone who's sick someone who's discouraged, someone who needs answers, when they come into my presence, because Jesus is in me, the hope of glory, that things change for them. So I'm not coming to church as a consumer, although I do receive in this place, but I'm coming to encourage the body. I'm coming to bring hope to the people around me. And so my message this morning is about being faithful and committed and being a part of a body. So since the beginning of creation, God always has an instrument and a purpose. And let me explain that. So he created man and woman in his image, and then he said, be fruitful, multiply. The instrument was man and woman. The purpose was fruitful, multiplication, dominion. Then we see in, in Acts, after Jesus comes, puts on flesh, goes to the cross, pillages hell, is resurrected again, and the church is born. And now the instrument is the church, and the purpose is what? To change the world. Not in a taking over type of sense, but changing the world through God's presence, through his love. Every person we come in contact, there is a, a transforming power that's available through us. And so he's, we, the church is the final instrument. And what did he say? I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So when we left our previous church, which we left with a blessing, we blessed, we loved the foundation of truth we received there. In fact, I still listen to old sermons from Brother Dick Iverson. He married my husband and I. We have so much love for that house. But when we started Bethesda, it was like we hesitated to even call it a church. And I don't know if it's because we were, we noticed some cultural things that we didn't agree with. We saw how there was some uh, spiritual abuse, not in that realm, but in the whole church, you know, in the U.S. church, you've seen this. People have been so burned by leaders. And so we started to kind of partner with this, well, what do we call it if we don't call it a church? You know, we can just, we can just bless people on our own. Jesus can work through me. And I can minister to people on my own. I don't need to call it a church. I don't need other people. It's just me and God. And this has kind of been a familiar narrative in the season we've been in, right? We, we see people that have just kind, of, just kind of discounted the church and said, I just need Jesus. If I have Jesus, I don't have to go to church anywhere. I can just sit at home. I can watch online. I, it's just me and him. The problem with that statement is God created an instrument, <laughs> And he gave that instrument a purpose. And it doesn't matter if I have a fence 
or if I have pain, or if I have issues related to that church, it does not change the instrument and the purpose that he created. And so we came to this place where we realized this is the church. We can't throw that word out like a baby with the bathwater. The church was birthed, and it will live on, and it will bring, it will be the glorious bride that he is, he is coming back for. So I wanted to share some statistics that I read recently. Recent demographic analysis suggests that Christians will constitute a minority of the American population in less than 50 years. Now that's, that's a statistic that isn't the truth of God. <laughs> but that's what they're saying. By polling people right now and looking at different statistics, they say that the Christians will constitute a minority of the American popula population in less than 50 years. As recently as the early 1990s, about 90% of U.S. adults identified as Christians. 90% of the U.S. were Christians in the 90s. Since 2007, that percentage of adults who say they're atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular has grown from 16% to 29%. So during this time, the share of U.S. adults who identify as Christians has fallen down to 63%. We were at 90% in the 90s, now we're at 63% call themselves Christians. Now, with COVID... It got even worse. These are the statistics from post-COVID church attendance. 34% of people in the U.S. before COVID attended church regularly. Only 34%. This is right before COVID. Attended out of those 63 believers in the 63% Christians in the U.S., only half attended church. That dropped another 4% after COVID. So statistically speaking, right now, only 30% of believers, of Christians, attend church on a regular basis. Now, this, this message is not to bring shame or to say that we have to earn God's approval or God's love by attending church. I'm not saying that. I'm saying God's heart doesn't change towards you if you go to church, but your heart changes towards him. <laughs> Your heart changes towards him when you make church a priority, when you make attending church a priority, not just for you, but for the benefit of the people around you. If you never went to church again, God would love you just the same. That's the absolute truth. But I can tell you, that the reason why we make church a commitment is because we are now new creatures. And our new nature is to live in worship, fellowship, study of God's word, and understanding that we represent change. That we are the ambassadors of heaven. The second reason is it helps you resist the devil. If I just see myself as a human being and not a supernatural being, what happens when a supernatural devil comes against me? If I'm in church regularly and I'm around believers and I'm immersed in community, then when that attack comes, when um, someone that I love gets a bad health report, when there's relationship stress, when there's financial issues, what is going to happen? I'm going to remember what I've learned in church and the people around me as support, and I'm going to be able to resist the devil so that he can flee. This is why we attend church. What I've seen um, what I, as I was praying, preparing for this message, are three reasons that we're ha we are where we are right now with church attendance. And I believe the first one is isolation. I believe that with COVID, it just got even worse because we started watching online and we started calling that our church community. And I'm telling you, when things happen, you can't call that your online church. You can't call an online church your community. Your online church can't marry you. Your online church won't do funerals. Your online church won't do marriage counseling. And 
And so isolation has snuck in. And I want to say you weren't born for isolation. And you can't win in isolation. You actually, the only way you can win is with a group of people together. Acts 2.42, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. And that word fellowship actually means koinonia. It comes through vulnerability and commitment. Koinonia is this word, this Greek word, and it actually means like communion, sharing meals together. It's a fellowship you can't, you can't receive, you can't have if you're just watching online. There is something with the breaking of the bread and the body that you can't receive yeah. just watching online. Yeah. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls. For he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not easily broken. I just heard this story of a, of a Navy pilot. And he, was, um, he went on like 74 missions and very successful career, was about to retire. On his 75th mission... And during Vietnam, he was shot down and was actually a prisoner of war. And he was six years tortured in Vietnam as a prisoner of war and got released and came back and actually flew some more. <laughs> what a guy. And as he, he was eating in a restaurant with his wife, and a man he didn't know walked up to him and said, you're Charlie Plummer. And he said, oh, yeah, how'd you know that? And he said, I packed your parachute. And Charlie looked at him and said, really? He said, yeah, I was working in the bowels of that Navy ship, packing parachutes on the day that you, were, you left and that you were taken and shot down. And Charlie went home that night and he couldn't sleep. All he could think about was the stranger that he didn't even know, that was faithful with the gift God had given him. In the underbelly of the ship, folding and pressing and making sure that parachute was put in correctly so that it would save someone's life. And I loved Kyle's message last week about the different body parts, the stomach and the ears and the eyes and how they all work together and how one body part is not less significant. Not everybody has a machine gun, right? But everybody matters. And here, we, he, you know, this, this Charlie Plummer, he was talking, and he said, I, I wondered if I had seen that person, that man that packed my parachute, if I would have even acknowledged him or said hello. Wow. There are people around you right now that are supposed to be packing your parachute. And that can only happen through vulnerability and commitment. Those two pieces, write them down, they are what combat isolation, being vulnerable with where we are, yeah. finding someone in your, in your circle and say, this is where I'm at. Can you pray for me? There is, I'm telling you, Ben and I have people come to us and say, oh, you're not going to believe what I tell you. And I'm like, we've heard everything. <laughs> there, there's nothing you can say to shock us at this point, 10 years in ministry. It's like, you know, you could tell us that, you know, you shot a rhino, and now you're being arrested for poaching, and can we help you get some bail? I mean, it, believe me, we've heard it. There is nothing, there is nothing too big for God, and you've got to take that vulnerable place and share it with someone and say, I can't do this alone. I need someone to pack my parachute. Would you help me make sure that I can keep on living and keep on thriving in the kingdom? I need your help. And we've gotten so used to being independent. Yeah. We've gotten so used to, I can do it on my own. You know, I was reading that, that um, story about David and his mighty men. And I used to actually read that story and go, oh, wow. Like, he had to encourage himself in the Lord. 
And I almost like took pride in that, like, oh, if I ever come to that place where people want to stone me, where my mighty men have turned on me, and they, they you know, they want to pick up stones and kill me, that, God, I'm just going to encourage myself in you. Honestly, I don't think that was ever supposed to happen. I think that was probably David's worst day. And here were the guys that he poured his life into. He laid his life down for them. They fought battles together. They took down giants together. And then all of a sudden, it's looking kind of bad. And they turn on him. And they want to stone him. And it says he had to, he encouraged himself in the Lord. And then he tells his guys, guys, we can take it back. We can go pursue the enemy and get back what was stolen from us. Jesus asked his disciples, will you pray for me for just one hour? And they fell asleep. Even Jesus needed someone with him in the garden. David needed his men in that moment. That should never be the narrative for the church. That should never be the narrative for leaders in the church or people in the church that they had to try to do life alone. That they had to encourage themselves in the Lord. That's a great option. And it's, it, it works, but it shouldn't be the norm. We were born to be stronger together. Thank you, Jesus. So isolation, and if we stay vulnerable and we're committed... And then indifference is the next phase where you go from isolation, you stop being vulnerable, you stop being committed, you think you can do it on your own, and you start stepping into indifference. And I'll explain to you what that is. Indifference is the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. Wow. It's the attitude that... I must be a good person because I don't hate somebody, but I'm not helping anybody. And I'm watching things happen right in front of me, people in need, people with issues, and I am just choosing to be indifferent. I don't want to get involved because I got my own problems, I got my own issues. The problem with that is you were designed as a new creature to find purpose in helping somebody. In fact, you won't feel fulfilled in life until someone else is able to be helped by you. Indifference is the enemy of the church right now. And the only way to solve indifference is passion. Passionate love for Jesus. Serving the local church. Those things combat indifference. They actually, they, they keep us in a place where we're actually designed to be. And I think the next phase from that indifference is insolence. It's a, it's a form of pride where I don't even need anybody. I'm going to figure it out on my own. Um, you know, I don't need the church anymore. They just hurt me. I'm not going to go back. Well, I've got news. The church is filled with imperfect people yeah. and imperfect leaders. <laughs> We're not looking for perfect churches. We're looking for the family of God that can keep us in a place of protection and resisting the devil so that he flees on a consistent basis. So the answer to, to this insolence is humility and unity. Proverbs 13.10 says, Wisdom opens your heart to receive wise counsel, but pride closes your ears to advice and gives birth only to quarrels and strife. Let's open up to Judges 7. This is such a great story, and then I'll close. Judges 7. Now, this is, a, this is an era in Israel where there's no king, and we just have these deliverers that God's raised up, these judges that were bringing freedom to Israel. And it, said, it says in the Bible that during these days, there was no king and all the people did what was right in their own eyes. 
Let's talk about pride for a second. What's right in my own eyes is the truth. Instead of being submitted to the word of God and his will over your life. And so Judges 7, we'll read it together. Verse 1. So Jerubbabel, that is Gideon. This is the New Living Translation. And his army got up early and went as far as the spring of Herod. And the armies of Midian were camped north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many warriors with you. If I let all of you fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast to me that they saved themselves by their own strength. Therefore, tell the people, whoever is timid or afraid may leave this mountain and go home. So 22,000, 22,000 afraid people left. How much fear is in the world right now? It's almost like it's almost like fear is being like a currency. It's like being traded. It's like if I can make you more and more afraid, <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. I mean, you just have to open up the news, open up Facebook, talk to people in the grocery store. It's fear, 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 fear. I'm telling you, fear is not a feeling. It's a spirit. It produces itself as a feeling, but it says the spirit of the Lord has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And if you struggle with fear, you need to ask someone to pray for you. Because fear opens up the door to torment. And it'll give you nightmares. It'll, 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 just, it'll make you question every decision. Get some deliverance from the spirit of fear. Because I'm telling you what, it's so prevalent in the world right now, the church needs to rise up in this area. And we are not the 22,000 <laughs> that went home. We are part of the 300 that is fearless. We are fearless. Proverbs 31 says she laughs with no fear of the future. That's a sign of the bride. She laughs with no fear of the future. So 22,000 of them went home, leaving only 10,000 who were willing to fight. So now he's got 10,000. That's still pretty good. But the Lord told Gideon, there's still too many. You know, God loves to use the simple things. He loves to use the people that don't feel qualified, that don't think they have the answers. When, he, when Jesus was picking out his guys, he was not picking out other rabbis. He was picking out tax collectors and fishermen and prostitutes. It was like he created on-the-job training. Jesus created on-the-job training. And I'm a testimony of that. I didn't go to Bible college. I'm not dissing Bible college, but I didn't get my theology degree. It doesn't matter if God calls you, you're qualified. Okay, but the Lord told Gideon, there's still too many. Bring them down to the spring, and I will test them to determine who will go with you and who will not. When Gideon took his warriors down to the water, the Lord told him, divide the men into two groups. In one group, put all those who cup water in their hands and lap it up with their tongues like dogs. Isn't God funny? Like, why? <laughs> I have a joke with my friend. I say, when I get to heaven, I'm going to be like, God, you got some splaining to do. You got some splaining to do. <laughs> you know, so in the other group, put all those who kneel down and drink with their mouths in the stream, and only 300 of the men drank from their hands. And all the others got down on their knees and drank with their mouths in the stream. And the Lord told Gideon, with these 300 men, I will rescue you and give you victory over the Midianites. Send all the others home. Now, you know, there's conflicting thoughts on why some drank with their tongues and drank with their hands, and I'm not going to get into all that. I just think 300 guys had to do the same thing. I think God was looking for 300 men that had unity. Because when you have unity, this is the one of the most threatening things for the devil. When you have even 300 people who have committed to encounter God, create healthy family, and impact their world. There's nothing they can't do. There's nothing they can't. Even if they go against an army, a legion, 
witchcraft, whatever it is, politics, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. 300 men who did the same thing. There's power in unity. And so I want to just encourage everybody today that I believe that if the church commits themselves to this in this season, vulnerability, commitment, passion, serving, showing up, realizing if I don't come on Sunday, there's a hole. There's lack. There's a body part that's not there. And I'm not, I'm not, again, I'm not, if you're sick and, you know, you got a wedding, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's important right now. Because we are part of a new statistic, <laughs> a new breed that's rising up. And I'm telling you, if this becomes our house mandate and we commit to this, I believe we're going to usher in the next amazing revival awakening that our world has ever seen. I want to put up a slide here from these pictures from, um, this is from 1966, Time Magazine. This is going to encourage you guys, and then we'll close. This was the cover of Time Magazine in 1966. Is God dead? Doesn't that feel like it's kind of the same situation right now? In our world, we have so much atheism, so much agnostic. We have people who despise the name Jesus. You can't even say the name Jesus. They despise prayer. We are in, living in one of the darkest seasons of the world. But look at the next Time magazine cover five years later. The Jesus Revolution. <laughs> and there are still people who were so radically touched by the Jesus movement that are m moving even right now that have created in incredible ministries. My, my parents were products of the Jesus movement. My in-laws were products of the Jesus movement. We're, there's still lasting effects of what that revival did. And I'm telling you right now, that's coming. That's coming, and you're part of it. And you're needed. You are necessary. And so why don't you stand with me? We're going to say yes to him today. God's formula for defeating the enemy is fearlessness, trusting in him, humility, and unity. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your body. You were broken so your body could be made whole. And we step into that wholeness today. Even if we don't feel qualified, even if we, we feel so vulnerable, like we don't have anything to give, we just say yes to you, Jesus. Use us. We make commitment today to you, Lord, commitment to your house, commitment to your body, commitment to staying passionate and serving, commitment to unity and humility. We say yes to that, Jesus. In your name, amen. Amen.